Right, so first of all, this is not a lecture at all in any capacity or form. I've just put together a selection of notes uh, on different topics that are part of my own research and that I would normally not expose in public, but since Nick asked me, I thought it would be good to just do it. All of them are nonsensical and all of them are exploring maybe certain areas that are uh, bit deranged in some point, so maybe I'll skip some of them, maybe I'll, I won't. But overall, since there is no intention to make a point and to discuss what that point might be, I think it's better to not take any questions, but talk afterwards. And just, if you wanna talk, we can have beers. Uh, and since these are notes, I'm just going to read through this compilation of notes. Some of them might be a bit skewed. I'm not a native English speaker, so therefore I just make these notes on the go and I compile them. And I try to make a kind of sequence out of them. But again, these are not meant to, to, to produce any kind of sense, rather are reflections on uh, maybe peripheral notions of community building and public at large, and I thought they would be pertinent to bring the flowers to the theater since it's such a community-based work, or like an overall, uh, how to put it in the best, uh, an overall a collaborative work that Nick has provided the conditions for it to emerge. All the images you see there are part of these notes. Some of them are my own works. Some of them are accidents uh, documented in Mexico by Enrique Metinides. There's an image from a work that I tried to uh, analyze to put into the context of artworks as, uh, or to, I, I inspect two artworks just to try to put it in the context of a gallery or an, or an exhibition. And there are, uh, yeah, what else is there? I cannot see, but anyways, I can, we can talk about that afterwards. So I won't stop and say, this is happening right now. I won't do any slideshow. <coughs> and as I go, I most probably will open beer. So I will stop for a bit, get a beer, open it and I will just get onto it now. So, yeah. mm, disclaimer. So this selection of notes explore the limit and threshold of action when its execu execution is determined by the societal distribution of public. In trying to inspect the liminal stages which define the structural delimitations of methodic applications of inflicting or acting upon the other, for the other and through the other in the most severe of ways. We must restrain ourselves from the desire to project an immediate configuration in which the possibilities for such action are restricted to the public performer distribution or like typical distribution of the concert, the performance or the installation. It is evident that in the current state of cultural development we currently find ourselves in the traditional configurations for presentation of actions in its performative capacity have already been contested through practices that today compose the historical importance of avant-gardist formulations. A movement consisting in the struggle between tradition and innovation, which is the principle of internal cultural development in historical societies, which can be carried out only through the permanent victory of innovation. Yet cultural innovation is carried out by nothing other than the historical movement which, by becoming conscious of its totality, tends to supersede its own cultural presuppositions and moves towards the, pre the suppression of all separation. And that's like a reformulation of the board now. Those who have managed to get involved in such suppression and that have procured the, to produce instances of transgressive dissolution to the predominant limitations 
of execution in different areas conform the historic reference we today take into consideration as new or provocative. Such is the case of the Futurist Rebellion against Museum and its inflammatory desire for an industrial vitalization of art, its effects on performance art, Viennese actionism, etc. Public interventions, fluxus happenings, its collateral and like boring consequences in punk, industrial music and noise, even the postmodern condition of the new materialities of media art that Lyotard was so obsessed with. Central to producing and unsettling the status quo in which the, the limitations of the models of presentation which had been firmly established as standard in the art scene of their time are actions which involve the possibility of self-exposure as complementary to the process of presentation, actions which revolve around the limiting situations and the excessive transformative potential of direct experience. Sarai's probe exerted by Viennese actionist Günther Bruce constitutes a deliberately radical transformation and reformatting of the traditional form through a direct desecration of custom in its excessive modification to painting and the constricting limitations of its decade. Similarly and more fundamentally to the explicit relation between audience and performance I'm trying to talk about here, is the bulldozer situation produced by Japanese noise duo Hanatarash. Both of those examples have been only brought forward for Nick's show because I thought they were pertinent. So in that sense, I will examine a bit both of those to produce a set of relations between what an audience can be and what a performance at large might mean. So in the first sense is Bruce, Gunter Bruce, Serrais Probe, which is also part of the slides. So in these actions, Gunter Bruce would self uh, would include self-harm, flagellation, and in general, the use of his body as a way to pervert and transgress the limitations of whatever form of art and whatever epoch was going on in Vienna. And then he would deliberately delimit and constrict what was happening with himself and the surroundings. In his last ever action performance, Arise Probe, the intentional cutting into his own body not only brought its integrity into question, but also functioned as a demonstration of sovereignty over the self and an extreme means of addressing social norms and stereotypes. The works of Gunther Bruce attempted to produce instances that would no longer maintain the customary division between canvas and artist by relinquishing to the idea of separation between his body his bodily fluid secretions and paint or pigment. In this sense, the composite event exposed himself to the capacity of action determined only by his own capacity to inflict an act upon his direct corporeal limits. This as a means to trespass a situation and a standardized format. <coughs> At the level of form, the radicalization of the self-harming act, which eventually leads to the cutaneous opening and the subsequent blood secretion produces an inherent durational act. In this sense, the witnessing of the experience is complementary to the final product of the action, as it supports and constitutes not only the reminder as a painting or the intervened object canvas blanket, but the overall instant of production through self-destruction. Alluding to this, the Japanese noise duo Hanatarash, consisting of maybe we'll know it and I'm just going to skip it, Yamatsuka and Mitsuro Tabata, who acquired notoriety for extreme performance, which included self and animal mutilation on stage, delivered in 1985 one of their last ever renditions at the Super Loft in Shinjuku, Tokyo. The action <coughs> basically consisted in trespassing the venue's wall with a bulldozer without letting any of the members of the public know in advance that the performance would have such a configuration. As Yamatsuka recounts, they got the bulldozer and rode it through the walls and through the doors of the hall, spinning a full 360 degrees, leading them to spin and drive through the audience. Aside from the exposure of the audience to the blasting of the bulldozer, the action would cost the duo more than 60,000 yen at the time. And after this situation, Hanata Rash would remain mostly a band act in also most of the venues in Tokyo. 
And of course, this would be a thing that would lead to their dissolution in 1998 and taking diverse paths such as boredoms and all these bands. No? So what these practices highlight, at least for me, in their incisive directionality is not uniquely a digression from the habitual form of a performance or an installation or an artwork or a new distinctive introduction of instrumental possibility, since clearly blood is not paint and the bulldozer is not the substitute of a guitar. What these situations project is a distribution of action in which the dissolvement of the limitations in the traditional modes of presentation take the central role. The quality and particularities of the actions themselves are fundamentally transformed by means of its directness and excessive character. The penetrating act in which the apparent division of collective and individual experience is severely transformed becomes essential to the unfolding event. Such severity is then not only a performative gesture but a reconfiguration in the execution of an action through which sensation is inflamed by a stabilizing, a victimizing link between the public and the performer. The question would be then, how can this configuration go beyond the secluded segmentation of an art form or an art context to which these actions try to respond and somehow disrupt? I think that in order to go beyond the mere formalization they aim to unsettle and its historical significance, we must scrutinize the configurations through which the localization of the victim becomes intrinsic to the action or victim on public. In the case of Bruce, in the case of Gunther Bruce, Reis Probe, we observe how self-infliction and self-victimization takes the form of the transgressive act. While in the case of Hannah Tarash, the clear disruption of the general order and the spatial limitations of presentation, along with the direct safety of the public, are submitted to abruptness and sudden danger. To explore if this division, once dissected as a model of relation between executioner, instrument, victim, public, can be dissolved and reconfigured into a situation which no longer takes its points of gestation and the delimitations of a performance, the secluded framing of cultural presentation, I aim to explore the drastic impositions of modes of action as a means of contesting the economy of distribution between a performer or an artist and its audience, as a means for an inspection to, public, to possible transgression of the demarcating mechanisms of division in spectacular dogmas we are so accustomed to. This economy of victimizing relations and the direct impact of the quality of an act stands in close contact to the analysis underlined in Pierre Klosowski's observation of Marquis de Sade characters in their torturous dimension as a method to define the possibilities of impulsivity in life as inverse to the commodification or standardization of emotion. Klo Klosowski proposes in an absurd analogy to the methods of production that, quote, for Marquis de Sade's characters, the quality of being a single victim on whom the torturer inflicted, inflicts his tortures sometimes takes precedence over the concept of the specific act. At other times, however, it is the same repeated act indifferently inflicted on a large quantity of victims which affirms the quality of the act. Both cases show how the reversal of the relation between the sensation and its object initially takes place, end of quote. This reversal movement in which the quality or quantity of the act is determined, configured and executed, enables the possibility of considering a set of relations in which an object and its sensation enter in an exchangeable dynamism depending on the dimension of the action. Nevertheless, the directionality of such action maintained by a higher structural domain of distribution, one in which, as nefarious and inconceivable as the act might be, preserves a rule through which the committed deed enables the torturer to act, the torturer to act upon the victim. This distribution of experience, which we also observe above in the self-inflicting quality of Serai's Prove and Gunther Bruce, and the scandalous quantity of bulldozing in Hanatarash 
preserve a condition of imposition that enables an actor to act directly, uh, to directly affect itself or others, but not simultaneously. This preservation of the distribution in relations, as unlawful as it might appear in the case of Marquis de Sade's characters, is sustained by a structural difference between the perpetrator whose act presupposes an effect in the experience of the victim. As George J. Siege points out in his analysis of horrific situations, the victim is central and is the central signifier in this relation. Yet we lack the complicitness of the victim in the action or the deed. This difference is more formally analyzed by Sergio Gonzalez Rodriguez in the Anamorphosis of the Victim, which he considered as the distortion of everyday life stability by a violent event. Gonzalez Rodriguez proposes that such an anamorphosis of the victim con contrasts with the symmetry of a law and the institutions responsible for guaranteeing the rights of the victim through mechanisms, measures, and procedures. It describes and alludes to the direct experience of harm, loss, danger, threats, or any other circumstances. So in the following additional notes, I will a bit explore the formalization of the spectacular distribution of a violent act as enabled by a higher structure in relation to Foucault's analysis of public execution, which is redundant and irrelevant. And to contextualize and tropicalize, maybe I will see its direct reaction to your local star, Valerie Solanas, as a reversal of the victim and a possible reformulation of this distribution victim executioner, and a response through the work of cannibal metaphysics by Eduardo Viveiros de Castro. So I will take a bit of beer right now because I'm drying my mouth. So that's like note number one right now, and I'll continue. So note number, I said one here, but it's two. Or like the first part is just an introduction. Note number two is this directionality in any action that includes a victim and an executioner. Uh, <coughs> so in his 1975 work, Discipline and Punishment, Michel Foucault provided a thorough analysis of the spectacular parade constituted in public execution in the 18th and 19th century and the tumultuous clamor that fueled the mass display of violence and torture that presented the crowds with a stylized form of debauchery where the public could attest the rigorosity of the ruler over the body of the victim, the exhibit of the utensils that could perpetrate such body and at times the corpses themselves who would remain displayed long after the execution had taken place. In this analysis, we observe a formalized demonstration of infliction upon the other by means of the established hierarchy of a higher authority. A political rigor of who is to be executed, by whom and under which circumstances that is fundamentally dictated by a superior jurisprudence or order. In this case, the legal system or monarchy, or in that case, the relationship between executor and executed is determined by a political rigor which serves as referee for any action. The mise-en-scene of pain is organized, served, and propelled by a formalizing system which allows the public to witness and marvel at the other's suffering from a safe, sufficient distance. The process of infliction, its tools, and its torturous sophistication were presented as elements of striking flamboyance in order to simultaneously highlight a moral judgment over the consequences of a committed crime. In such configuration, the idea of exemplary punishment becomes the ecstatic excuse for the spectacular, one that, as Foucault recounts, could make the crowds shout, rejoi rejoice, and fall into euphoria. The directionality of such torturous circumstances conform to a rigid distribution of collective experience, accommodated by a reglamentary institutionalized arrangement for public congregation, enjoyment, and exemplary rectitude. 
action, reaction, and encounter are then firmly dictated by a playbook which assigns roles to each of the, participa each of the participants of the executional act. In this sense, the practitioner, the victim, the public, and the rules of the event bring forward a linear administration of action, fear, and civility. Such a regulation of a spectacular experience, its spatial circumscription and tumultuous response, doesn't seem to be far from the practices which were common of the cultural epoch in the continent and which are pretty common now. At the heart of our contemporary models of presentation and their formalized distribution of experience, it appears almost inevitable to, in the most structuralist fashion, engage in a game of element substitution. In this substitutive exercise, we could replace the hangman for the performance, the gallows for the instrument, the authority of a legal system that selects and implements how the execution should be carried out, to be then equiparable to the most suitable of today's discourses or enabling institutions, while the object of sensation in itself would be transferred from the form of the singular inflicted body of the victim as the locus for voluptuous emotion and public arousal to the form of presentation or production in itself as object of sensational exaltation. In this sense, what we can observe in the limiting situation of the single victim quality of the act is transferred to the standardized limits of experience as established by the customary modes of presentation and the, limiting, and the delimitation of encounters to the habitual context and its appropriate spatial configurations. So another note, so another drink. You can also stop me at any time. So. So note number three, victim reversal, and this is like the contextualized bit where I try to uh, put in Valerie Solanas just for the sake of us being here. So an oppositional reactive figure towards this modeling of imposition by means of a predisposed directionality in the administration of actions would require a complete reversal of the systematization of experience through a direct response. If we follow Klosowski's distribution of sensation and object, we find that the reversal of the single victim configuration exposed by Foucault and the quality which is constituted in the punishing action would entail a quantitative imposition of an act over several victims. This reaction would then be oriented not to a single individual as in the case of the public execution and its isolated criminal, which we can equate equate to the direct infliction of pain in actionist configurations, but rather, to the act, but rather the act would need to be directed towards the very structure that determines the criminal as object upon which capital punishment is to be exerted. An action which would need to be inflicted upon all members which are components of this very structure. Such reaction and its potency is then oriented towards the victimizing limits of regulation, but first and foremost to those who have the power to decide how to apply such regulations. If we consider the spectacular demonstration of power which is embedded in the presentation of punishment as a display of rectitude that aside the torturous destruction and dismembering of an individual, it aims to satisfy and educate an audience who has been congregated to observe and listen to the implementation of such a regulatory force. This regulatory force would then become the object of a quantitative reaction one which would be aimed at those in charge of imposing the structural division embedded in the distribution of experience through the separation of the victim from the rest of society. In order to counter such division, the reaction would then be deployed by the victim itself against the components which establish the division. To directly attack the customary methods that we are so 
commonly attuned and that we so commonly accept as innate to the production of a spectacle requires then a perpetration of the structures of presentation along all constitutive parts which solidify its establishment. To react to the totality of such structure is then to reorient the excessive potentials of direct action towards all instances which appear as limiting and regulatory. A response of such dimension is present in this particular case as we're talking. <coughs> in Valerie Solana's proposal for Society for Cutting Up Men, in her project for a new society, she localizes the victim in all women, an allocation movement which enables her to orient a group reaction against the totality of patriarchal structure whose actors are all men. Solanas commences her manifesto by proposing that, quote, life in this society being at best another, another bore and no aspect of society being at all relevant to women, remains to civic-minded, responsible, thrill-seeking females only to overthrow the government, eliminate the money system, institute complete automation and destroy the male sex, end of quote. The disposition to destroy the totality of a system through all its, in this case, male actors becomes the ultimate motivation for the new model of society proposed by Solanas. It becomes a quantitative raging action against the overall established order and against the structure which perpetually designates the roles and limits of that very order by regulation and oppression, or quote unquote regulation and oppression. In that sense, the gesture of scum is a demolitional one that aims at breaking apart from the old conventions formulated by an imposed system. It renounces and rebels against any possibility for acceptance, negotiation, and rational understanding of the parts to rather initiate a call for arms. In this configuration, the call to arms modifies the relation between the victim and the executioner by suggesting communal violent retribution as the motto for directing a general quantitative action. Violence in its communal configuration, as Franz Fanon has pointed out, is a practice which binds individuals together as a whole, since each individual forms a violent link in the great chain, a part of the great organism of violence which has surged upward. A binding situation which also Arendt, Hannah Arendt following Fanon, considers an intense group coherence which carries a stronger potency than any civil or private bond. This form of brutal unity against any regulatory entity that becomes archaic and which imposes itself as the predominant structure upon which experience is constricted emerges as Hanatara's bulldozer crushing and crumbling the edifice of conventionality through the radical desecrating intervention of anormality that on the average submissive circumstances is considered the regular order of things. As Solanas further points out in the manifesto, quote, scum will become members of the own workforce, the fuck up force. They will get jobs of various kinds and on work. For example, scum sales girls will not charge for merchandise. Scum telephone operators will not charge for calls. Scum office and factory workers, in addition to fucking up their work, will secretly destroy equipment. Scum will unwork at a job until fire, then get a new job to unwork at." End of quote. Another dimension of this retaliation of scum against the dominant order of things, far from being merely irrational and vengeful in a simplistic way, stems from a thorough comprehension of the degrees at which in the or like the, in this case, dominant structure, the male dominant structure that she attempts to attack, imposes its organization. So in contradistinction to the lawful order of execution through law and the classical performative configuration of public execution described by Foucault, Solanas proposes a destitution through the overall disruption and destruction of the infrastructure, which will accompany the eventual extermination of all men an extermination which would not remain exclusive to the textual manifesto, 
but that would eventually be initiated and carried out in its appropriate scale when, as, yeah, yeah, as, as you all locals know, on June 3rd, 1968, Solanas attempted to assassinate Andy Warhol in his factory studio by firing 3.32 Beretta shots at him, an event that would lead uh, to her incarceration and eventual reclusion in a mental hospital where she was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. Aside from her individual figure and the relevance of her victim, what this did and its relation to the manifesto highlight is the potency of reactive capacities embedded in a directness or directivity which formulate attempts to destabilize the sense of dominance from any so-called higher order. In Solana's case, that higher order is articulated in the manifesto as a denunciation of the veneration of art and culture which leads to the constant intrusion of our sensibilities, of pompous dissertations, uh, on the deep beauty of this and that turn. The desire of extreme dissolutive desecration in the veneration of the artistic and cultural order becomes the fundamental tool against the oppressing structure of a tradition ingrained in a status quo, which she directly attempted to violently dissolve. Her disgust at nonconformity as a victim of such dynamics led her to formulate a guiding manual for the merely rational and vengeful in a simplistic way and stems from and through the perpetration of the general victim, which in this case then becomes man, so that's the reversal, and the structure which they conform to. The quantitative domain where the emotion of the destructive act, which is always the same, takes precedence over the single object where destruction is oriented towards and then produces a situation of general heterodoxy where the driving force behind the action is to react and intervene in what we accept as so-called normal. Irrespectively of the clear orientation of her despise against men, yet not to undermine it, Solana's desire for reactive mayhem against the cultural glorification rubs close shoulders with movements like the Futurists, who funnily and conversely wanted to eradicate feminism and its desire to demolish museums and libraries, and to another extent to the abolitionist anarchic postulates which are present in hardcore punk, thrash metal, and grindcore, and that through their rejection of convention within a society they oppose despectable situations ingrained in it, they aim to propel the emergence of different transgressive forces of action as an applied methodology of uncontainable, violent, disorganized crowd pushing and even slamming. In this case, or as a response to that, as, club, as punk club owner of Mask, Brendan Mullen observes in the documentary The Decline of Western Civilization, the pogo dance and the mosh pit, which take the form of an abnormal level of adrenaline, where sometimes a bit of violence spreads out because, and primarily because the kids are desperate of the environment they live in. But framing all of this to another point, I mean, the notes are mental. This clash of sweating bodies that composes the traditional separation between audience and performer, as in certain situations, this so-called mosh pit, consumes the stage, leading the performer to get involved in the banging, slamming, and pushing. The violence, which seems to be intrinsic to the formulation of a classical structure of relations, similar to the ones we have observed in the regulating form of the torturous spectacle of legality, in Foucault and its larger ramifications in the qualitative object of action in the work of, for example, Gunther Bruce, produce a reaction against such an established structure which either in the punk, the futurist, or the scum emanates from a denunciation and active rebellion that regardless of its superficiality, read radical, it's it, rather than its, re <laughs> fuck you know regardless of its superficially red radical appearance, constitute an opposition to a, to a general structure that circumscribes the possibilities for direct action in both orders. The structure of revenge towards any imposition falls into what is called a diametric dualism, 
and which, according to structuralist anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss, is static. That is, it cannot transcend its own limitation. Its transformations merely give rise to the same sort of dualism as that from which they arose. Diametric dualism, whether in the revolutionary or the conformist, or in those who shake up and try to demolish the existing order of things, as it is the case with the avant-garde or the so-called avant-garde, or those who try to perpetuate such order in the case of the traditional, is a closed loop maintained by a similar structural relation of the pacifist and the rioter. As anonymous anarchist uh, French group, the Invisible Committee notes, quote, to the moral proscription of violence by the one, the other always replies with his purely ideological apology of violence, where the pacifist always seeks to absolve himself of the, of the state of the world to remain good by doing no evil, the radical seeks to absolve himself of participation in the existing state of things through minor illegalities embellished with hardcore position statements. Both aspire to purity, one through the violent action, the other by abstaining from it. Each is the other's nightmare. It's not certain that these two figures would go on existing for long if one didn't have the other deep inside him, as if the radical only lived to make the pacifist shudder inside and vice versa. So end of quote. This remark, we see that provocation and the disturbance of any apparent order, whether in the arts or in the streets, have become ingrained in the very mechanism that neutralizes any, possibi any possible deviation from the norm by including one into the other. In this, in this kind of configuration, we finally realize why this God save the queen actually needs a queen and why a urinal needs a society of independent artists. Agitation demands what to agitate in order to attain the sense of purity outlined by the Invisible Committee. In the same way, contemporary critical art and theory needs the subject matter upon which they exert its elegant criticism. Diametric dualism preserves the symbiotic structure of the trigger response affair between the most radical friend and the most conservative enemy. The friend and the enemy division, in the sense of Carl Schmitt, is safeguarded as a necessity for keeping both parts structurally functional by violently maintaining each of them diametrically distant. Under this structural model, violent action becomes a neutralizing factor, a sedative rather than a disruptive element, which still complies with the structure of the victim as audience through its relation to the executioner as performer by establishing a culture of spectatorship that diminishes the impact of any act and turns them into a habit, even if this habit is the most atrocious. So I stop again, I, I have a sip of beer and then maybe I continue. Or maybe we stop there. There'll be an additional note that I'll leave for Nick, and that's on public execution and sacrificial cannibalism, which is the, w the way out of this. Uh, so the, Nick has asked me to read the, the, the last note, which I don't know why he wants, but I'll do it. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's short and it's just the kind of synthesis of the kind of thesis and antithesis of, on the one hand, the kind of public execution and spectacle, the notion of the spectacle and the will to, let's say, alter or destroy that spectacle by Solanas, which I only put as a reference here. And so the note th number four um, is savage relations and I'll just read again so to imagine another way out of this loop which is the Solanas the, the kind of diametric dualism of the pacifier 
or the pacifist and the violent riotist is to imagine another way out of this loop becomes a necessary task in order to consider the implications of excess in any configuration that is able to go beyond the structural reaction which reduces even the most hardcore actions irrespectively of their quality and quantity in the sense of Marquis de Sade to the oppositions of a diametric dualism and the purity of a statement. In order to engage in such task, we must first inquire into conceptual and practical apparatuses that transform the scheme of the victim, the executioner, and which corrupt and abandon the relational arrangement of punishing distribution presented so far, along with the constituent reason that justifies its spectacularity or vengefulness. To dissolve such opposition would initially demand a rejection of the possibilities for acting upon the other in its dependency to a violent reason or a, riot or a reason to act violently. This abandonment implies that in order to leave the stigmatic imposition of violence and to be able to rearticulate its excessive potency in its implication in any action, we must first sacrifice the need to have a reason that su sustains the opposition between performer, executioner, and audience victim, and the imposition of one upon the other. Such an abandonment would simultaneously entail a sacrificial loss of purity or any righteous statement which preempt any action in the form of clear justifications or any of the constricting regulatory mechanisms of reference which dominate the dynamics of the discourse in position in the contemporary arts to which any action in any of its products or manifestations is subjected to. Different from the diametric dualism of punishment or revenge, punishment in the sense of Foucault, or revenge in the sense of Solanas, and the respective capacity to facilitate or negate the propositions which conform the order of things, sacrifice in its most simple approximation modifies the homologous relation of victim and executioner by producing a third relation with a larger deity or divinity through the sacralization of a victim, either in its expiatory form or as a rite of communion. Yet, as Claude Lévi-Strauss observes in The Savage Mind, this is not where the ultimate task of the sacrificial rite is consumed, as he proposes that the operation of sacrifice is simultaneously the production of a connection with a superior domain followed by an irrational, irreversible cut, which is based on the elimination of this connection through the destruction of the victim. In analyzing this dissolution, Claude Lévi-Strauss proposes that, quote, sacrifice is an absolute or extreme operation which relates to an intermediary object. From this point of view, it resembles, though, it is at the same point, uh, it is at the same opposed to them, the rites termed sacrilegious, such as incest, bestiality, etc., which are intermediary operation, intermediary operations relating to extreme object, end of quote. Within these implications of sacrificial irreversibility, irreversibility which establish and demolish a connection with a greater deity, levi Stoss tries to make sense out of a senseless act, which he can only postulate as extreme by comparing it to the most profane and blasphemous of actions. Sacrifice, then, exposes the structuralist demand for making sense, just as we observed in the purely ideological apology of radical violence. The presupposition that an excessive act can only reach comprehension by means of an excuse, whether in the form of a deity or an apology, seems to restrict the possibilities for excessive action in a similar order as that of the diametric dualism. 
a restriction that teaches us more about the cosmology of Levi-Strauss than that of the people he so effectively studied. Once divinity or the higher deity are left outside of the equation, the real transgressive dimension of savage sacrifice surfaces, as it does not make sense. Its senselessness corrupts the early plague of supposedly cultural and Christianized catechists and structural anthropologists equally. What actually takes place in sacrificial practices is a transformation of another order. As Brazilian perspectivist anthropologist Eduardo Viveiros de Castro has observed in his exploration of anthropophagic warrior sacrifice between the Arahuete and the Tupinamba tribe, where the captive enemy would live for long period among the captors, well treated and in freedom, while the, perpetra while the preparations for the execution were taking place. The captive would eventually even get spouses from the tribe, which transformed their status among them, turning them into brothers-in-law, because it was only men, brothers-in-law of the captors. The sacrificial execution, where the body would be ingested by the whole community, would then arrive after the captive enemy had already received a new name, commemorative sacrification, the right to marry and have children, as well as the access to paradise. To this dynamic, Viveros de Castro observes that, quote, the transformation imposed on divine, on divine Arawate cannibalism by Tupinamba human cannibalism, born not on the symbolic content or social function, but instead consisted in a paradigmatic sliding, a twist, or translation of perspective that affected the values and functions of subject and object, means and ends, and self and the other." End of quote. This paradigmatic sliding brought forward by cannibalism already provides another ground for reconsidering not only the structure upon which a senseless action can occur but the sense of utility and distribution that allows the relation to even emerge. Beyond the anthropophagic structural dilemma of the Arahuete Tupi lies a savage transmutation of perspectives, which is further embodied in their war songs, songs of war. In these songs, the executioner speaks of himself from the point of view of the slain enemy. The Arahuete he has killed and speaks of his own killer, the one who speaks by singing the words of his deceased enemy as a cannibal enemy. This transference disentangles the incisive action to turn it inside out, reversed and transgressed. The flesh eaten loses its importance and the transformative potential of the action is what takes over and remains. Savage extremity and its impure statementlessness opens up a, a possibility outside the structural order of trigger response and or victim executioner functionalism. And it is precisely in this configuration that the scheme of sacrifice, devoid of any divinity and not that of punishment, becomes relevant to the experiment of thought I was trying to outline. It is not a question of admiring, defending, or considering sacrificial cannibalism as a reference for any artwork that talk about pre-colonial rituals or emancipatory decolonial rituals, but of taking its savage, disruptive, practical, and conceptual derangements as apparatuses for direct actions that operate in the realm of loss and transformational sacrifice. To consider such an apparatus in its implication to any direct action would forcefully demand an abandonment of ideological apologies for excusing the severity or gentleness of a deed. It would simultaneously demand the renunciation of the rules impose, imposed as structural distribution and conversely, any radical reaction to those re regulatory instances. 
to reject the possibilities of falling prey to any diametric dualisms that tend to only loop and not go anywhere, we would need to ask ourselves, what would this sacrificial transformation mean at the level of community building and social relations, even in the age of technocratic normalization? What would be transformed with such a conceptual and practical apparatus as that of anthropophagic practice in relation to acting out in public? What would we do to ourselves? What would we do to others? And what would others do to us? So that's the end.